So we're going to hear Imam Tayyip talk about Islamic fundamentalism and its impact on queer Muslims. Now, of course, this is also for many of us a lived experience. So Imam Dai is going to speak for about half an hour, and then we will have about half an hour for Q's and A's. And also, if people are, I'll invite people to share their experiences. Um, but you know, for me, a large part of this space is going beyond our victimization and into our own empowerment. So maybe also people have experiences of how to deal with our um, with the impacts that we have suffered and how we have overcome them, triumphed, or are dealing with them, that would also be really awesome. So, I... Okay, assalamu alaikum. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Uh, today's topic was one in terms of Islamic fundamentalism and how it's impacted on queer Muslims. Now, of course, this seems to be a, a major subject, particularly when we look at modern day pink washing to Islamophobia in its form of pink washing again, because we do have people who don't want to admit that we have Muslims killing queer Muslims for reasons not necessarily only because of a certain view, but because they've taken a certain view, certain view that we are Kafir. We are not we're non-believers because of who we are. So taking that from the very basic thing, I thought well, we'll do a little bit of history as to where this concept came from. And those of you who have historical backgrounds and know about the history, this will be just like a re quick review. And then after that, it's more it's modern implications. And then I want to talk about another issue that's coming up, is that we are facing in the West another form of extremism that's coming. And I always elaborate on that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to get started, now we all heard of you know Al Qaeda, ISIS, Buku Haram, and various other jihadi organizations from various places and how they proliferated around the world. But one of the major problems is that too often in the media it's indicated that those Muslims are the extremists. But in actuality, extremism or fundamentalism is an American phenomenon. Mm. So the real problem is that back in the late 1800s, fundamentalists were those Christians who were reading the Bible in literary form, literal form. And these were our first establishment of what fundamentalists really meant. So, of course, our media people will then take jump on the idea, well, you know, fundamentalism, we know what that is, but you must be fundamentalists as well. So, of course, Muslims are trying to push back on the process. They tell, well, jihad really means this rather than war. It means struggling, it means trying to improve yourself, all of those other things. But in actuality, we know and we have to admit that that idea of jihad is the one that's most prevalent, the one of war, and is considered part of the war. But one of the things that we have to look at is that although this, this has a long history in, in, in Islam, one of the things is that we have to observe is that it was devastating to the peoples of the past as much as it's devastating to us today. So we can't think about this as being something that's not a historical long framework that has come to us in our, in our present time. So anyway, um, let me just jump a little bit ahead. I think it's important that when we talk about jihad, that we know that it's, it's traditionally applied against Muslims in the modern time. But what people don't understand is that it's been Muslim attack upon Muslim attacks in the past as well. So this is not a new phenomenon. It just wasn't the idea of attacking Christians and Jews because you can't make friends of them and those kinds of things. But they've also killed Muslims who just were of the same sect, of the same school of thought even. And this is where the, the Haraj, um, I'm losing my pronunciation now, Kawajrites, Kawajrites, <laughs> um, came about in terms of they were actually the earliest in within the Islamic community to do this. Now, if those of you who may not have any idea of Islamic history, this is the time uh, basically uh, during the, the caliphate of, of um, Ali. And during that particular time period, they were part of the group who was opposing or actually was supporting Ali. and. Um, and then when Ali agreed to deal with 
They opposed and said that none of them should, have, that he should not have um, acquiesced to their demands and therefore started attacking the different uh, people. Now, and they said that because, you know, some say it's because of uh, improper reading of the Quran, but their belief was that if you're not doing it the way it's supposed to be done, how we read it and understand it, then we don't get you. And so they chased down folks and killed them off, and there was a, a schism that happened between various groups to bring them down and them escape. But prior to the bringing down, they tried to negotiate and talk, but yet they were opposed to that type of negotiation. So a number of them were killed or um, fought in war, and then some did escape. So that idea of that we believe a certain way and that we have we've read the Quran a certain way and this is how everybody else should understand it the same way this is where the problem stems from because the number of people the Prophet only had Muslims and then afterwards they started breaking into these various ideological schools that came about and so it separated the idea of a Muslim community and Muslim Ummah into dividing into a Muslim and Muslim Ummah who has different parts and different sects now um, I want to read something from uh, Dr. Marmadu Bakum, who's one of the professors at um, Mecca Institute. He wrote a religious leader on August 25th that he said, the fact that the perpetuators expect an abundant reward should not be ignored. Sadly, that belief derived from reading the Quran through the lens of fundamentalism. The reading of the Quran is tradition. We should not be surprised to witness angry reactions and denial on the part of those Muslims and their apologists who seek to oppose the view that the Quran and its traditions could inspire violent fundamentalists. From the background of this denial, shared by many Muslims, which he wishes to explore in order to show that literal and selective readings of the Quran can result in devastating misinterpretations of the, script, of the scripture. So if you read things literally, you'll have a very literalist response. It says this, it says it's red, and what you do with the red is what you do. Not understanding that red is a color, and what you do with color also applies too. So it's just such a, a narrow way in which you look at things. But what happens is that, um, I talked a, a little bit about the, the theology of the fundamentals in, in um, American aspects. So what we can see is that Though we look at Islamophobia, or what people refer to as Islamophobia, is that these things run because of the hegemony of earlier times when Christianity or the laws that were based on Christianity came into the Muslim world. It started in some of their secular laws as well. What it did is that it, it, this hegemony against the Middle East, Africa, Pakistan, Af uh, Afghanistan, those places around the world. That what it did is that it separated them to where they were only limited to certain areas of the law that they can work on. Usually that was family law. But other areas of law, commercial law, mm. aspects of government, those types of things were forced into a framework of Western ideals in terms of that. And it still influences us today. We can look in Africa and see Africans wearing those white wigs. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just an example of how the stuff still influences us today. Uh, so this is where this thing stems from, and it continues to influence us even in our day-to-day -day lives. So, does um, everybody understand the white wig reference? You know, British and those place societies where Britain um, was in there, they would wear these white wigs. You know, mm -hmm. and so the, the faces changed from white or Caucasian to African, but they still had the same symbolism and the same legal structure in place. You know the judges in the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> you know, the white folks are not wearing them anymore, but the black no, folks are. Yeah, yeah. yeah they are done with that. <laughs> okay. So, um, let me run through. I did, did that part already. So, one of the things that we, we find that's consistent, and what was the Kawajites, at the time, they had three things, or basically three things that they believed in. And in modern times, we actually have five things. Well, no, actually, it's four things and five things um, today. They had a declaration of kuf, or unbelief. And this is what they indicate when they say someone is a kufr, blah, blah, blah. You're an unbeliever. 
that gives them reason to say that because you're not, you're an unbeliever, then as we read the Quran, then you should we should get rid of you. Top fear, which is charging someone with unbelief, and those who disagree with them on any theological issue. Now, and then they always point back to Prophet Muhammad, the pristine community that Prophet Muhammad developed. And this is a, a, you know, a myth that they do. This is part of their idol worship. There's nothing wrong with honoring Prophet Muhammad, but when you start putting our prophets on pedestals, and we are down here, the prophet is up here, and we can never rise in our thinking, never rise in our actions, never rise in how we are, then, of course, you turn the prophet into an idol. And therefore, oh, we can't do anything about it, so we'll just be plain old sinners and keep doing what we like to do. Uh, the next thing is that the right to kill anybody of the above, meaning that those that they, they check fear against or those who they believe. And in this context, it means if you don't believe like we do, then you're expendable. The right to kill Christians and Jews, this is something that was believed back then and continues until today. These extremist movements continue to use that reading of the Quran to say that we don't befriend the Christians and Jews, and therefore, if they're staying in the way, we can kill them. And then, um, the next thing is that it's what this exclusiveness in, in exclusiveness in Islam, meaning that that is the only right religion, R-I-G-H-T, religion, and therefore, no other religions should be believed in them. No other sense of faith should be believed in. If you don't believe like we do, go back, go to number one and start over again. Which makes it simple and very simplistic, but it doesn't really show the, insidi the, the, the insidiousness behind it. That they're they're they want to be as much as be as hegemonic and in control of everything as anyone else that they say they're opposing who's doing the same thing. So it's the mirror thing. You're doing so and so and so, but I'll do it, but I'm not seeing what I'm doing, which is just like what you're doing. So, um, as we look at the more modern understanding of what the foundations of Islamic extremism is, I refer to it um, as an underpinning of those pillars is thinking, thinking. That thinking is, it's used in metaphysics, but it means that when one focuses on the negative, that means that they're refusing to open up to new ideas, refusing to open up to opinions that may differ and may actually improve something, but since they know they got it right, then they don't listen to anyone else. It's like a pool of water that is cut off. Eventually it stagnates, stinks, versus an open flowing pool. The water comes in, washes it, you know, clear and remains open and flowing and keeps its value uh, to human life because it is fresh, it's new, it's inviting, like that. Now, Fazlur Rahman <coughs> has stated that in the teachings, in his teachings, and I love this actor, when I first read him, you know, nearly 30 years ago, I was like, wow, I can't believe this guy is really unbelievable. But he said that about every 150 to 200 years, there is a spiritual revival and a legal reform in Sharia. How does this come about? As he indicates, is that through the process of the rereading of the Quran for the period that the people are in, they get a new idea as to how they should apply the Quran in ethics to their day and time. And through that process, the law has to change. If something was 150 years ago and it doesn't apply today, it's not today, or how then you change the laws to apply to how things are done today. But too often, is um, these are the things that allow the extremists to get away with things because they don't even know their own history that well or ignore that history. Now, um, as I, I'll read this part here, it says that we currently, within the same time frame, we, we utilized 1858, for example, that when the Wahhabism came into being, there also was a decriminalization of homosexuality within the Ottoman Empire. So we saw this change come where the Ottoman Empire was opening up to new ideas and new ways of doing things from a more European Western view. And then you have those who were pulling back and regulating things to a point that that's not Islam and therefore we are going to do this a certain way because we've read the Quran and we know this is a particular way it should be done. But yet here we are 160 years later and we're ripe for the change, but there are others who are 
pulling back, saying we know what, what Islam really means and we're going to fight anyone who tries to change that view. Now, so one of the things that we can look at today that is causing the, the fundamentalists to do things marriages and those types of things, they definitely want to get, get at you for that. Though over the last several years, um, Al-Qaeda has dispersed into several different areas ge geographically, and they have helped raise other types of groups that have come from there, as we saw like with Boko Haram a couple of years ago when they kidnapped young Muslim women and forced them into servitude and sex labor. Or we say the same thing as this in ISIS today, using the same concepts, using the same thinking process, and they're doing the same thing, but they're even going to even further ex extent by killing just about anybody who disagrees with them. Whereas in the past, some of those restrictions that may have been there were not uh, specifically limited to, uh, but they were limited to only certain ones, like people of the book, not necessarily other ones, because we find in Islamic history, they did permit other belief systems to exist as long as they paid their taxes. So this is a slight difference that we have today. Now, now I'm not certain, but if you know, if you buy their oil, the ISIS oil, maybe they'll let you get away with something. I'm not sure if that's the way we can do it or not, you know? But anyway, um, so let's see where I'm at now. Oh, okay, so saying that both, um, as we've gotten reports from escapees from ISIS, for example. Now, I did, before I came, I was trying to meet with a guy who had just gotten to the States from Syria. And he was, I was gonna sit down and talk with him and get a more on the ground report, but we weren't able to meet prior to my leaving. But I still do plan on talking with him. But so I could bring you something that's really, really up to date. But we have to understand that those individuals who were there um, the one thing I do know and from reading materials and talking to a few people uh, who've come earlier when they got out of Syria before the real crisis developed, they indicated that what they would do is that they would capture someone or they would seduce someone in using a grinder, is that what they call it? Yeah, grinder. Using these apps, you know, these hookup apps. Get some grinder without the E. Yeah, yeah. So. Bringing, bringing someone there, capturing them, and then torturing them. And then they give up information about other people, and it just continues to spread like this. So it was done insidiously in order to bring people about. And so uh, many of them who were, who did wind up in that situation, some of them were killed, some wound up getting away. But as we get from reports, some of them have faced very horrible deaths. So, and I won't even go into describing some of those things. I think some of you have probably read the papers and have an idea what I'm talking about. Um, but as much as we've seen in the videos on, on YouTube, they're throwing people off tall buildings and things, burning them that way. And if they don't die from the fall, they stone them. So they're following um, ad hadith statements or beliefs in order to, do, to carry out these things because they see you as not being your kufr. So here we are again with the same term going again. Uh, let's see. Now, I'm going to put it this way, is that I've read some of the reports that when LGBT, LGBTQI individuals repented, they're still put to death in order for them to make it to, to heaven after their deaths. So you have to repent, then they still put you to death. So the carnage, in my mind, is reminiscent of the sack in the Baghdad in 1258, where they had the skulls stacked as high as the gates <coughs> entering there. Well, I'm certain that with the thousands and tens of thousands of queer people who probably have been put to death in Iraq, Iran, Syria, the, the, the stack may be twice as high. So we have to recognize that this is something that's going on, and we're being impacted in such a way, usually under duress, for these things to happen. So, I want to say that, um, how much time have I used? You have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, yeah. great. So, one of the things I, I do want to talk about a little bit is that 
I was saying earlier that we're going to talk about the extremism in the West. There's a uniformity of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim extremism, and that's a new threat for us. I read two, two articles over the last couple of weeks that talked about it. In Texas, there's an evangelical Christian group there who's been working with a Muslim group there in Texas. Sorry about your state there. <laughs> But what they've done is that they've, under the guise of helping each other when they've had economic problems, like the church needed some money, the Muslims raised some money for them to do this, and then they wind up having iftars and those kinds of things. And uh, the church has been helpful because they had some people who were social workers to help Muslims just coming into the country to acclimate things of this nature. What they're finding is that their, their ideas that brings them together is one, religious freedom, and we know what that's doing. Uh, uh, and then the second one, <laughs> and the second one is marriage equality. Families, you know, of good family uh, values, family values, family standards, and those two things are bringing these groups together. And we also have some Orthodox Jewish organizations who are doing similar things. Who are joining me and using those, those two aspects, those two aspects of bringing them together so that we can work together. Well, I'm not scared of them, but we should be weary because they're doing something that is now bringing a whole aspect together where they don't have, they say, well, you're not Kaffir. We can work with you on this particular issue, but we'll keep separate our, our religious beliefs. But we'll work together to get rid of those other guys, <coughs> gals, and transgenders whatever alphabet you fall into on the, in, the, in the suit, they're, they're, they're working to get us. Victorian values. What would you say? Victorian values. Victorian, Victorian values, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, um, it's hard saying you're being afraid sometimes. <laughs> okay, so, you don't have to go to the collective cross. <laughs> Um, I left it outside somewhere. <laughs> so what, the thing is, I, I say that we must remain vigilant in recognizing, researching, and investigating all these public pronouncements against fundamentalism taking place and actually see that it is still going, it's going on today, but in a different camp. It's not the Muslims, it's the other camps as well. And we should not turn a, a blind eye or turn away from that, that truth. And that means that unless we recognize, accept it, that this is happening and that we can take positive steps to make some changes in this, then we're going to wind up being caught up in a similar framework and then having to fight the battle much more diligently in order to try to make things more at peace. If we have some peace now, let's maintain that peace and increase on it rather than having to lose ground and then have to fight back again. And one of the, some of the ways in which we're able to do that is both inside our community and outside of our community. As citizens, we can always lobby our, le our legislatures, we can write letters, do those types and voice our opinions in the media. But within our community, we have to support each other. Now, as an old, a folk from the old school, I'm talking about 45 years ago, one of the things that within our community that we continue to do, and I think part of it is because of how we have our society and how we've had to grow within our society, come to recognize and feel better about ourselves in society, we still don't like each other all the time. And sometimes we use the same things, race, age, gender, to cause dissension within our groups. How many women in here know a gay man who still uses their male privilege excessively. How many um, gay men, feminized or feminine gay men, recognize that some other gay men also use their femininity against them? <coughs> so these are some of the issues here and how we've kept this dissension. In the US today, we have marriage equality. Now white gays are looking for what do we need to do next? Well, there's folks who need who are in poverty. There are folks who need these things, those things, those things. 
hopefully if some of the major organizations like HRC is taking those steps to do some of those things now, changing the, param the parameters, but it's important that we you know, work within these organizations and continue to get them focused on new things that brings their efforts to help other groups who help them. I remember at a meeting, um, the religious leader aspect of HRC last month, I mentioned to them, I said, you know, one of the real important aspects is that as many people of PLCs who have helped y'all in this marriage equality program across the country, now it's time for you to help them and Black Lives Matter. Help us in, in issues of the Latinos and their immigration status. You know, these are folks who have helped you. Now you have to turn your, turn your attention to those issues that are important to them. If you really are about developing a, a more unified and I don't want to say complete, but a more unified community where we can still have our variances in there, but we do support those particular standards that are important to all people. Uh, let's see. What else? Wrap up? I'm going to wrap up. Now. Um, so one of the ways in which we can help now, rather than, than highlighting the atrocities that we have today, what we can do is now give money to those organizations that are helping people in safe houses in these countries and helping people escape. I'm just going to say this in the way I'm, I don't know. I'm not judging anyone, but if you're at the bar and you spend $5 for a drink, save one of those drinks and give that money to an organization to help another group. I'm not asking you to give everything, but I'm saying to you, you've got to give something. Did you hear what I said? I said, you've got to give something. If you don't have the money, give your time. Mm -hmm. Give your voice. Help organize. It's important to us, if we care about us, then we need to do the things that help us. So I just want to make certain that we do this. Um, when you see things, you see people talking about the issues, inform them. Don't deny them. Inform them about things. We know you, you understand this, but that's not ac accurate. Let me give you some more information to help make you better understand it better. And if you can do that, you'll see a lot of things change, and particularly if you can work <coughs> in the legislative arena. Some of those folks are, because they depend upon their legislative assistants who may not have a clue on what's going on, contact them and tell them about the information. They'll utilize it. Sometimes being, you know, a source of information for them can be very powerful in making a change in how laws are developed in your area. So, um, we have to make active steps in order to change in our communities, and so let's dedicate our resources towards helping others in the time of their utmost need. And with that, I end. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'd like to pull a couple of threads and sort of touch on them for a second. Um, you talked about the HRC, that's the Human Rights, Human Rights Campaign. Campaign in the United States, that was an organization at the forefront of marriage equality. Except once you got marriage equality, they took up a campaign of spreading American values to the world. So there's a little bit of cultural imperialism that's now part of their platform, which is very problematic. Maybe this workshop should have, this session should have been titled Fundamentalisms rather than simply Islamic Fundamentalisms mm -hmm. because in a place like Uganda, it's actually Chris, American Christian evangelism that's feeding the homo <coughs> violent homophobia, but then the Muslims, not to be left out, jump on the bandwagon because then they got to show that they're as good as the Christians in maintaining family values, right? So, um, <clears throat> and you talked a little bit about the West. But one of the things that also we find in the West, at least with my experience in, in Canada, is also the silencing that takes place outside of the Muslim community. Because this notion that Muslims and Islam are a monolith, mm -hmm. then we can't possibly be real. And for some of us who are involved, for example, in Palestinian solidarity work, and uh, being then faced with pinkwashing, that because you are engaged in Palestinian solidarity work, you're an anti-Semite, and therefore, you're an Islamic fundamentalist, mm -hmm. right? Which is what something that I've been labeled, go figure, right? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, I really liked your, your comments about the stagnation and the clearing of, I wanted to bring forward uh, Ibn Battuta, uh, Islamic historian, arguably the parent of modern anthropology, who traveled for 25 years 
documenting peoples and cultures and their practices and so on. And one of the things that he observed is that in a lot of Arab Bedouin societies, every three generations there was a clearing out of the city. Because what would happen is you would have a city and you would have the nomadic tribes around and things in the city got lax. People got easy with their, with their observance of tradition and custom and so on and so forth. And the people on the outside who were the nomads and so on kept this sort of more rigid and hard, harsh codes would say that this is, you know, this is uh, deteriorating morality and they would go in and chuck the people out and, and occupy the city and the, the people who were in the city would be chucked out into the desert and the cycle would repeat itself every three generations. So now if you look at what's happened in Saudi Arabia, it's third generation time. And yet, it's now being maintained in artificial ways because of the technology, because of oil, because of Western co uh, collaboration. And so, Saudi's royal family is not going anywhere, at least not quite yet. Um, but so, you know, these are also cyclical issues, but how do we interrupt the cycle as well? So, I'm going to open it up to questions, comments, and experiences. Silence is definitely yes. Yeah. Yes. I think we cannot say we are, we are the co uh, completed or united unite community if we exclude fundamentalists also. I'm not sure how can we do, but uh, we don't. I think we need them to. I mean, not need maybe, but we need to inform them about us, and we need to unite with them too. I don't know how can we do. Just I'm uh, putting on the table. Uh, we, we need uh, that they are now, especially now, they are uh, it's incre increasing. Being fundamentalist in Islam, increasing, and we need to uh, we need to be with them too. I don't know how can we do that. Well, I'll respond to that in, in this way. We can acknowledge them, recognize their particular points of view, and promote our views, our alternative views, but. We don't give them the power or give them the right to think that they own or have the, the, the head of the line for everything. And therefore, if they don't recognize that we differ, not in, we differ in ideas, then that may be a way of, a segue, a way of which people can have more conversation. But quite often, what I found with some of the fundamentalists Imams that I've had discussion with is that their attitude is that you don't know what you're talking about. So you'd be open to talking to them, open to having discussions with them, but I don't hold that unless I give all my power to them, will they be happy? Well, you're not going to get it. As the, as the I don't know if you know In Vogue, but it's a, a black female musical group in the U.S. and they have a song saying, you're never going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you're just going to say it. Man, that's right. Man. <laughs> I think on that, the best thing we can do is on an individual basis. If people come to us for explanation, we can, if, they, if we think that they're actually going to listen, you know, try and explain our points and they can go away and see what they do. Makes them realize that the door is open if they want to join that community and be a behaving member of the community that's not going to start bullying anyone. Then, okay, but you know, it's like you can't just like open the door wide open to them and let them all come in because you know, unless they reform themselves, they're crazy at the moment. And they, and they also think that their numbers, you know, is, if they have more of them there, then they're right. You know, this uh, position of numbers. Um, um, the numbers make the might. The tyranny of the majority. The, yes, the tyranny of the majority. Thank you very much. What's particularly dangerous is if they think, whether they're Christians or Muslims or whatever, that they think that they're the voice of God. You know, then it's like a problem there. You know, they need to uh, see psychiatrists, I think. Thank you for mentioning that about the. You know, I had no idea that there was this sort of, um, shall we say, strategic alliance between, you know, Christian fundamentalists and Islam in America. Um, so, you know, for me that says there's a whole new set of challenges that arises even even in the West. Um, so, so my question is, 
you know, where would you say that the point of intervention really lies? Um, do we look to specifically Arab countries? Do we start out in the West or, you know, where? Well, but if, you, if I understood you correctly in terms of intervention, I think it's going to have, have to happen in both areas. Simultaneously? But, yeah, simultaneously. But I think that we have a bigger impact here because, or in the West, because they, they're not so in rain right now. And so I think that would be one of the ways to uh, to start the process of making this up. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Well, you finish I'm done. I'm done. I think this question is particularly meaningful because what happens right now is I, I work in certain areas where I can see on a different level what's happening, not necessarily a better view, but where finance is involved. Like right now, in the you were talking about the Middle East. In the Middle East, you have special financing. There's a place called the Western Studies Institute, which is based in Saudi Arabia. And what they do, they come to American universities and offer money. I got some of them. Go. All those conferences, and they offer a lot of money. For each person that they're sending, it's about $600 to get. Right? So they send those professors here for a conference, and they make certain conditions that when those professors come from Saudi Arabia, Western Studies Institute, they speak to a large group of people, the Muslim community, etc. The hidden agenda is that when those professors come, they're doing what uh, El Farouk was talking about. They speak down to you. When you argue back, because they come in numbers. And when you speak, and they have certain behavioral issues which Americans don't react to because they don't know what it is. For example, I'm talking right now. And if it's a whole bunch of professors from this particular country here, what they're going to do in between themselves, they're going to start talking. So they shut me up. They come with particular strategies. So that money thing is asking where it's going to begin. They, they are making sure that it. Voices against fundamentalism that might arise in the West, you're buying them out. Some of the, and I need not get into that because it's almost the character of slander, but there are professors within the American institutions who do not have supposedly Muslim names, but they work with that place because of the financial benefits, but uh, fomented fundamentalism within the university campuses. So I, I do think, if I can add to that, I do think that. Um, just as the extremists or the fundamentalists can form alliances, so can we. So one of the things that you know the, that I've been doing through the Unity Mosque is building alliances with progressive religious communities, with Christians, with Jews, um, with other faith traditions. I'm a little bit tired of the sticking to the Abrahamic traditions, like we're the hear-all and the be-all. There's a whole world out there that that's, doesn't fall under this, cat, this patriarchal uh, nomenclature, right? Um, but forming those kinds of alliances. I do think, in making my comment, uh, going back to my comment about the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, that we also need to be very careful that we're not then engaging in an Orientalist narrative either and forming an us versus them, which is what you're touching on as well. Uh, by not excluding uh, um, religious conservatives for, uh, and so on and so forth. But just as they have the capacity to get together on their ignorance, we have the capacity to get together on, uh, on our hope. I mean, what challenges does that present? I mean, uh, aligning with, you know, making, making connections between, for example, queer Muslim organizations and queer Christian organizations? I don't think we need to limit ourselves to a queer. I, mean, I, I think we should just, just be, you know, understanding ourselves and connecting with people of like hearts and like mind, um, regardless of, of who they are and where they are. I mean, these fundamentalists, whatever their religious stripe, actually condemn each other to hell, except when it comes to to, to women and queers, and then, then we're the first item on the, on the menu. Um, I'd like to see what happens if they actually succeed, what they do to each other at the end of the day, right? Um, so I, I do think that we do have those capacities uh, to, to build a, a, a coalitions with like-minded and like-hearted communities and individuals and, and, and groups. Um, so we shouldn't disempower ourselves uh, in that way. And I don't think we should limit ourselves either in terms of who we, we ally with and, and form coalitions with.
So I am wondering whether our sheikhs from Africa here have any comments that they would like to offer, and I'm also going to invite uh, Dr. Liu to have they have any comments. Any Four comments? after the sheikh. Your sheikh too, in my book. So you go first. Um, I think I want to pick up his point about uh, you know being inclusive, uh, and I and I think it's a point that is important philosophically, uh, but it has to be uh, orchestrated in a practical level uh, with certain considerations. For one thing, you extend acceptance to the same degree to which acceptance is extended to you. And that's always problematic when um, you believe in inclusivity, as, for example, I do. Um, what becomes the practical limits in being able to exercise it? So I never exclude um, anyone who identifies as a Muslim from that identity, and I support them in that. And I would support them against uh, anyone who would try to exclude someone because they are Muslim, whatever is the forum or whatever is the you know, objective of that forum. Um, but um, in the practical sense, um, I have, uh, in trying to negotiate the inclusivity, I have seen that sometimes it is thwarted because the inclusivity has to first acknowledge and recognize the equality of the people with whom there will be, you know, this uh, inclusion. And so if they choose to include themselves, um, even if you send the invitation, which again I would encourage, it does not mean that um, it's going to happen just because you have the good intent. Um, and then even when they uh, agree to have some participation, um, keeping in mind that you know practical rubric of acceptance to the field be, uh, also be one of the parameters of expectation. I expect you know that I will be accepted even if there's going to be disagreement. Um, the uh, rules of engagement sometimes have to be made clear because a filibuster that prevents other people from having the opportunity to present their views in. Um, in a contradiction to you know uh, what uh, certain fundamentalist views may hold, which includes the privilege of authority that they assume for themselves, um, and then all conversations end up stopping. <coughs> so um, I think it's a good point you know to think about. But I think strategically, when you want to bring it into implementation, you have to think very clearly about you know how you do it. But I think philosophically, I would agree with it. You know, it's just that I've seen that it's necessary to you know, practical levels and set up certain rules and engagement. So let's have who watches the watchman at the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sheikh. <Shaykha. laughs> Sheikhs. <laughs> Interesting. One, please. Yeah. On what I've on the overhead, I think for us the interviewers. Uh, the question was, why was it, why are we so homophobic to homosexuals? From my element, I just found that we, uh, we don't have to be, I mean, we have to advocate, we should go and advocate people wherever we're coming from, just because. Um, on whatever we learn, I observe that Jesus did not come, he did come to the sinners. And he, he never rejected sinners, as they say, if it is so. Then, uh, I wonder why this hatred, anger, discrimination, violence, exclusion against homosexuals, are they worse sinners than those adulterers, drunkards, smokers? 
drug users, thieves, witches, wizards, and satanists. <coughs> so my answer is no. As one of believer, I strongly stand to reach at to those with compassion without making their sexuality an issue. And in my spiritual being, I have not taken homosexuality the principal issue. The issue is lack of relationship with God. I believe it is against the will of God to victimize persecute and advocate homosexuals, homosexuals should be killed just because of their orientations instead of helping them. There is any. Certainly, putting, the, putting them in jail, as I heard some other people in, that, in the other countries, they put them in jail, they do bad things to them condemning them in the excluding them from activities in the societies will never be solution. Homosexual, homosexuals are human beings based before their sexuality. Laws are aimed to protecting society from harmful or harmful acts of other humans. Homosexuality does not harm or hurt anybody. Two adults do it in their private confines without harming anyone. Unlike adultery, where a wayward person is harmed, it's also not like a stealing, killing, lying where some are, someone will be hurt. If there is someone hurt by hormones, as they say, that should be caught alone. So government has not, as religious leaders have no action that hurts no one. It has no business arresting someone who action whose actions hurt no one. Since since like adultery killing stealing are worse than homosexuality because they hurt both God and human beings. So as religious leaders, government should not judge them. They had they had no one except God. Only God will know that to will know what to do with them, as He will do with all of us. We are not qualified to do God's job. All on His behalf, because we have our own sins than homosexuality. Let's have one another in spite of our different and human and human patterns. So this is my <coughs> message to uh, me as a religion a religious leader and I share my fellow religious leaders that whenever we go the uh, from my problem from new people I understand the day uh, uh, it was said by somebody here saying that uh, if we if we have to ask some other things from those who are experienced in uh, what is happening on the ground. So that is, we have to interact with you people, communicate with you people whenever we've got something to deliver or whatever we can do. That is my message to my fellow religious leaders, imams, and chefs. Thank you. Bye bye. So, so we, um, we're actually over time, but we started late. So I'm going to say that we have 10 minutes, and I'm going to give you the last word, but I'm going to come to Ismail first for brief comments. I just want to point out to you, I just posted on Facebook earlier today, 81-page uh, report of from um, Human Rights Watch on violations in Gambia against LGBT people. And I wanna, want you to think about this. I used to have three cats. I had two boys and a girl. Alpha, the alpha, the, the, the main boy, and he would sometimes get mad and smack the other male cat. And then that other male cat would go and smack his little sister. Okay? 
So think about that in the context of what's happening in terms of LGBT people, in terms of uh, occupation, colonization, global corporatocracies, and global poverty, and the disempowerment of people in the global south, but also economically in the global north. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn to Ismail for something and for, for your comments, and then Sheikh, I'm going to give you the last word. Is that okay? yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a bit uh, worried a little bit about um, how we go about uh, fundamentalism in the sense that when do we draw the line so that uh, as we fight for the good cause, we do not end up fundamentalists ourselves. Uh, uh, there is a tendency uh, in some aspects that as we fight for what we believe, there is a possibility that we might also end up uh, doing the opposite. Doing that exactly, we fight against uh, what we do not want to see happening. Uh, in the sense that uh, probably for the peers, how we draw the we Uh, first and foremost, we look at the Quran, it says, a thing that was heavy, make it easy. And the hadith comes in, Yasiru wa ratu asiru wa sakinu wa ratu nafir. Accommodate, Yasiru, make it easy for people to know it's easy. And that thing that was heavy, make it so easy, that is so accommodative. You know, that is in short. Uh, our entry point is to know the root cause. One of it is the... Uh, I can say. Yeah, say the uh, collaboration Muslims, Christians, and Jews know each other. Now, for us, as a religious point, it is HIV. It's a soft point. Because every government have accepted HIV is there. This is there. You go for VCT, you go for this. They have accepted. Now, we take the little chance and interpenetrate through that as we are advancing on religious human rights. I know he's a lawyer. He can put in the function of this, declaration of this, quite all right. But let us use evidence-based approach we have HIV in our community. Let it be our entry point. And the donors, they should identify that. People are dying. We are here laughing. Yes. You don't know what is happening to our people. I talk on behalf of them. They talk on behalf of me. And when they look at you, their expectation, their expectation is so high that something from Cape Town is going to liberate all of us. But here we are sleeping, talking, eating, and the rest. So my observation, first point, the entry point is HIV. Then the rest follows. <coughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to be praying Salat al Dhabar and Salat al Asr combined upstairs, followed by lunch. Um, and then at 2.10 the, is the uh, final set of sessions. And the Religious Leaders Forum will be back again in this room. And the session that uh, we have planned for here is how religious leaders can affirm queer Muslims. And it is in the form of a draft charter. So we're hoping that we'll have 
some kind of at least a working document that um, so you're welcome to come back particularly the religious leaders we want you back and if over lunch while you are feeding your bodies if you can also stimulate your minds as to what we can put into that charter thank you very much uh, everybody's welcome to join us upstairs for prayer if you wish to join us not yet there's always more room there's always